Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. I'm here with Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins, and this is our Thursday, February 11th update of the Westchester coronavirus outbreak. Uh, we have been reporting twice a week on a regular basis, and so we're going to give you some statistics on the outbreak uh, infection rates, also on our process of vaccinations, which is in many ways the more interesting story of the two. And we'll talk about a few other things, and we're going to introduce you to the newest member of our Westchester County team uh, who will be coming on board of the Parks, Recreation, and Conservation Departments where we have our other senior executives with us here. So we'll introduce all of those folks to you in just a little bit. Uh, the numbers that we have from the New York State Tracker, which are out right now, you can see this for yourself. If you uh, Google up workbook uh, New York State DOH uh, COVID-19, you'll come to the same set of numbers. You'll see these numbers broken down by county statewide. There's a host of other different indicators. You'll look at issues of comorbidity and ethnicity and so forth. For our purposes here, we've been reporting every time we've given you an update really deals with countywide numbers in just a couple of different categories, just to give you a, a sort of a footprint of how the infection is going. Uh, right now, we have a uh, pandemic to date, meaning starting in March 1st of last year to where we are today, 99,984 individuals who have uh, at some point in time contracted COVID within Westchester County. Uh, against that number of those that were uh, positive as of two weeks ago, 92,062. That means today we have active cases, 7,922 active cases. That continues the diminution of active cases that we've reported on the last couple of times we've come to report. We're under 8,000 active cases. That is good news. A week ago today, we were at uh, 9,343 cases. And two weeks ago, we were at 11,193 cases, and even higher than that, uh, beyond that, back on January 21st at 11,470 cases. Uh, we had uh, peaked up through the holiday season, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's represented peak spikes, if you will, that pushed those numbers up very high. We almost hit the 12,000 active case mark fell just short of that, and now we're on the down slope, and, and we're happy each passing day if we have less infection than we had two weeks ago, the number of active cases reduced, and so now it's reduced down to 7,922. To give you a little bit closer breakdown, we haven't talked about these numbers in a while. Uh, just uh, overnight, Wednesday into Thursday, we had 675 positive cases tested for COVID out of 14,518 total tests. That represents a 4.6% infection rate, less than 5%. There were times during the summer where our infection rate was at 1% or less than 1%, but as we started to peak up, we were pushing close to the 10% infection mark, meaning 10 people are tested, one person uh, is classified as having COVID. That's when you approach 10%. Now, uh, over a larger base of individuals, the number's dropping down. We look at that infection ratio as a very important number. And if you know, when the governor created yellow zones and orange zones, he was looking at the localized infection rates and uh, was putting those uh, restrictions in place based on that uh, set of metrics, at least at the outset. They changed the metrics later to discuss uh, the amount of hospitalization uh, beds that were available. But we're encouraged that the total number of active cases are down. We're encouraged that the infection rate is not as high as it was. We're by no means out of the woods. These things can oscillate pretty dramatically. Uh, we're still waiting to see if there's a Super Bowl spike, and we won't see that for at least another week. Uh, but uh, we're, we're happy that those numbers are down rather than up. The most recent number that we have in hospitalizations, 489 individuals have been hospitalized as of Tuesday uh, for COVID. Those numbers are down from where we were over the last few weeks. That number, 489, compares a week earlier to 521. Two weeks before that, 569 were the numbers, and 588 three weeks ago. So we're encouraged that the number is down by 100 hospitalizations over the course of the last three weeks. That would represent uh, roughly about 15 percent reduction in the number of people hospitalized. And of course, people generally don't stay hospitalized for three weeks. They're, if, if they're in the hospital for that long a period of time, then they're in real serious shape and, and we're really fighting for their lives after that length of hospitalization. Most people are hospitalized for a period of time and then go home, but other individuals contract the disease at the level of intensity that requires hospitalization. But the numbers are going down. That's a good sign. The numbers of fatality uh, obviously are rising. That's an accumulative number for every person that passes away. So as a comparison, we look at the number of people that have passed away over the prior week, and we can compare week against week to determine if there's a trend line there. We have reached 2,002 deaths in Westchester County throughout the course of this pandemic. We're just shy of a full year. 
uh, by about uh, two weeks, slightly more than two weeks, and we've lost 2,000 Westchester residents, 2002 to be specific. Um, that number compares uh, a week ago, uh, so that we've had 54 deaths in the last week uh, based on um, the COVID outbreak. If you go back the week before that, we had uh, 73 deaths uh, over the period of time. So the, the number of deaths have decreased a bit, but they're still very high numbers. For those who may have been tracking this back in the summertime, we had weeks with no deaths, uh, and we hope to return to that situation as soon as we can. But the overall numbers do show us that uh, we, we hope that we're heading in the right direction. And ultimately, uh, when you would see these numbers really move would be dramatic drops when enough of Westchester residents are vaccinated against the disease and then don't get the disease. So there, there will be very few new tested positives compared against where we were uh, two weeks ago as people clear through the protocol, very few new cases, the active cases drop. And then we get down to a point where we see where we did in the summertime, uh, a minimal number of cases, and uh, we start to look for the day where we start to return to normalcy. People feel more comfortable resuming their normal lives as those numbers start to go down further. The other thing that we track is the number of vaccines. Uh, before we had vaccinations, all we had was to try to track how much the disease was spreading and if we could reduce the spreading with masks and social distancing and all that stuff. Now that we have a vaccine, the foot race, as I've used the same analogy every time I've said this, is how fast can enough vaccines get out to protect enough people from getting the disease. If you don't get the disease, then you're not going to be hospitalized. You're not going to wind up facing fatality. And so all of that is important. Now, we have uh, three locations. I've mentioned this now over the last few weeks that we're involved with directly as county government. The state government is in charge in the overall uh, response to COVID. They, uh, they set the parameters by which industries opened or closed. They set the parameters for testing. They set the parameters for data collection, and they set the parameters for vaccine distribution. The county is one of a number of players that receives vaccines from the state. And we directly administer vaccines in two locations, at the White Plains Health Clinic, which is here in downtown White Plains on Court Street. And uh, we also uh, now do it directly at the Westchester Community College. Those two locations, the county government is directly involved in. At the Westchester County Center, that is one of the major statewide vaccination centers. It is run by the state of New York. It is our facility, which we've turned over to, uh, to the state. Um, we're going to be introducing uh, Commissioner of Parks and Recreation, Kathy O'Connor, and uh, she cries a tear every day when she knows that that particular facility is out of her ability to use, as is Glen Island, which is being used for testing. But uh, they're being uh, sacrificed for an essential purpose for us to try to fight and, and beat this disease. But at the county center, the county is a partner there. There are, there are individuals in the health and the parks and recreation department that assist in the administration, the implementation of that center. And that is the single largest place in Westchester County where people are being vaccinated every day. Uh, we're dealing with well over 1,000 people every day. And that operation is 8 in the morning to 7 in the evening, seven days a week. We operate six days a week at the county uh, uh, community college and at the health clinic as well And those hours. So where, do, where are we overall in terms of number of vaccinations given? There's two metrics now that I'll share with you. I don't want to, you know, make it too complicated. But the number of, of vaccinations administered now start to take into account the second dose vaccine that everybody's received. You're not properly protected until you have both doses. But there is a time lag between when you have the first dose to when you have the second dose. So if you have properly taken the first dose and, and your three weeks hasn't expired, you have gotten the vaccinations that you could have had up to now. And if you've reached that three or four week, depending on Moderna or Pfizer, you get the second vaccination. So we are giving out two doses, but we are vaccinating one person. And the, the metric that at the end of the day matters is a million Westchester residents. You're gonna have to add on the people who work in Westchester County, who don't live in Westchester County. They're important too, because if they drive the bus that you're on, and they're not vaccinated, then they might get the disease. Or if they serve you at the counter, uh, the lunch counter that you stop at, they, don't, they could live in Connecticut or New Jersey or someplace else, but they could spread the disease. So we want to vaccinate people who work here as well as people who live here uh, without regard to uh, you know, residency. Um, at the Westchester County Center, we have administered, the Royal We, State and Us, <clears throat> 37,670 uh, vaccinations to date from when they opened to now. And that's a significant number. It's over 1,000 a day. In fact, it was almost 2,000 yesterday. 
the capacity to grow those numbers involve both first and second doses being administered at that location. We don't have a breakdown of how many first doses, how many second doses, but the overall vaccine, uh, vaccinations are 37,670, which is a good number, and uh, the, you know, we need more of them in order to get out more, and all of that uh, requires us to get the, uh, the product at the top of the pyramid so that we can administer the vaccines. At the uh, clinic and the Westchester Community College, those that are under our uh, scope, uh, on a combined basis, we've administered 7,600-plus uh, vaccinations. And in terms of individuals, 6,658 people have been vaccinated. And of that number, 1,000 of them have gotten their second dose. So the total number of vaccines we've given out is 7,600 and change. The number of people served is 6,000. Uh, and 600 and change because 1,000 represents the second dose. And the statistics will, uh, will uh, you know, be a bit confusing, but we want to be transparent so you have an understanding of what happens. And I have to emphasize this. We've done it before. The second dose is essential. You cannot skip the second dose for any reason, you know, that's just personal. It, it, you will not be protected appropriately from the disease. The whole purpose of being vaccinated is to make you, so, make you as resistant to the disease as possible so you can't get it, and in theory, you can't give it. And if you stop with one dose for whatever your reasons might be, uh, you haven't protected yourself properly. And you might think you're protected because of the first dose. The, the, the second dose activates more aggressively the first dose. If we get down the line and there's other products that come online, some of them are one-dose products, we'll deal with that when we get there. We're not there yet. <clears throat> right now, the two products, Pfizer and Moderna, require two shots, and uh, that's what we're tracking. We are encouraged that we have as many people um, uh, vaccinated as we have, but I have to repeat what we said every single time we've talked about this. The production at the national level by the pharmaceutical companies, the ability of the United States uh, federal government to obtain the vaccines, buy the vaccines, and then be able to distribute it, there is insufficient amount, quantity of vaccines to be able to vaccine everybody who is eligible. And as of today, not everybody is eligible. People 65 and older are eligible. Uh, people who work in certain uh, career fields, police, fire, uh, EMS, uh, education, teachers, uh, now people who work in restaurants and people who are taxi drivers, limousine drivers, funeral directors, uh, bus and transit drivers. There are certain categories of occupation that entitle you to be able to get the shot. And uh, the governor has established these uh, eligibility categories and done so with a mind <clears throat> to try to uh, deal with those people who have the greatest amount of public contact in the society or provide a public service like fighting a fire that's considered essential and we want those people to be protected. Uh, we have not uh, yet gotten the authority to open up vaccinations for people who are under the age of 65 and do not have some type of underlying health issue. So if you're 45 years old or 25 years old, you're not eligible to take the vaccine uh, until we get the word from Albany that we're ready to open the door and do that. As of Monday, we open up a category of individuals to be eligible for vaccination who are people who are under the age of 65 who do have some underlying health cares, comorbidities as they're called. Uh, and they are comorbidities, they're, they're physical illnesses that relate to things that would make you more vulnerable to the COVID virus. If you have COPD, it's a respiratory issue. If you have diabetes or hypertension, and apparently as, as the virus attacks your system, it affects people more fatally who have diabetes or hypertension. Uh, uh, if you are uh, under cancer treatments, if you are dealing with HIV AIDS, uh, there are other things of that nature that, that fit into an appropriate category. Uh, that information is available uh, on the website by New York State. <clears throat> they, have a, um, they have an access point, uh, am I eligible? And if you go on to the am I eligible, you'll be able to hopefully answer the questions you have. Everybody's got a unique story to tell, and, and no one website like that can answer every question. They've also established a phone hotline, as with every hotline in the world. The phone lines are jammed, and you have to be patient and wait for the next person to come to try to answer your question. All of these situations are structured by the state of New York as they are in charge of the overall policies of what we do in terms of dealing with the COVID uh, uh, outbreak. But um, 
Beginning Monday, those individuals with uh, comorbidities are going to be eligible for vaccination. And, uh, you know, the governor at any point in time, we, we watch his updates, will determine whether there's uh, other eligibility, other rules to the game. You've seen a change from time to time. We've changed the testing rule. We've changed the isolation and quarantine rules. Those changes have come uh, from Albany down to us. We administer them. We had a discussion a couple of weeks ago about availability of high school sports, high-risk sports. That protocol changed. The yellow zone, orange zone, that protocol changed. So there's always some things that are changing uh, in some fashion. I'm going to ask Ken Jenkins in a second to discuss the most recent uh, press release that came from Governor Cuomo outlining some of the quarantine issues which uh, may face some of these people. As I mentioned with these numbers, we've hit two sort of notable or just on the cusp of hitting two notable milestones. 100,000 positives in Westchester County, uh, and uh, we have hit over 2,000 deaths. Uh, both of those are numbers that uh, give you an idea of the breadth of the, uh, of, of the pandemic, and in case of the fatalities, the depth of the pandemic. Uh, we find that 100,000 people um, suffer, have, have been suffered to the disease. 2,000 of them, 2%, 2 have perished from the disease. And uh, these are sobering numbers. And, uh, you know, sometimes we can get lost in percentages. Percentages might give you a sense of comfort. Just imagine if somebody said to you, 99.9% .9 of all airplane flights land safely. How confident are you that you're going to get on an airplane that will crash if you're the 0 .001 airplane? In point of fact, the airline industry has a much higher level of safety. Airplane crashes are extremely rare. Uh, uh, commercial flights are extremely rare to many more decimal points down than that. But when somebody says 99.999, that's a score I'd love to have had on any test I took in high school. I fell well short of the 99.99 level. But don't let the percentages fool you. 2,000 people or 2,000 families that have lost somebody they love because of this disease. I, I lose my patience when people say it's only 2% fatality. That's, that's not an acceptable response, and I push back on it. I'm not, I'm not afraid to push back. I think this thing has hurt us. It's hurt a lot of people. It's hurt a lot of families. And it may be that in a family of six people, one person dies, but the other five are affected by it, and it'll never be changed. So the pandemic has reached all six of those people in the family, the person that passed away, and those that remain after. Um, I want to point out as well, as we look at these, uh, at these different issues, that there's been some, you know, concerns. Uh, you basically saw it over the weekend. There were some lines at the county center on Sunday. Uh, there, there may be lines from time to time that are very small. The Sunday situation was unique. I explained it uh, when we did the update on Monday. I'll just repeat it again. We had people that came for their appointment much earlier in the day on Sunday because they knew that there was an impending snowstorm coming in, and they wanted to make sure they could get their shot. Well, we, we give them out on a timed basis. The county center stayed open throughout the totality of Sunday. Uh, the fact that some people came early uh, helped create a greater pressure at a certain point in time. Those lines dissipated fairly shortly after the middle of the day. <clears throat> but um, we encourage you to focus on appointment basis. And if you don't have an appointment, you're frustrated. But if you have an appointment, make the appointment date. Be there sufficiently in advance. But uh, do not fret unnecessarily because that's what will create a, a demand that exceeds the supply of uh, of time that we have in order to inoculate everybody from the disease. And we think we're all in, in good shape uh, if we can just get everybody vaccinated. That issue is beyond our pay grade here at the county level. We need something to happen at the federal level with the pharmaceutical companies and uh, get greater supply, get it to the state, state gets it down to us, and then we're in a position to expand our vaccinations. Uh, Ken and I uh, spoke at the last update and, and Monday how we spent some time last week, and he and I both at some of the pop-up centers that were created by the state in certain urban parts of the county. Uh, and we also know that there are local pharmacies that are being given a quantity of vaccine to disseminate to people in that 65 and above category who are their uh, individuals who are their regular users to try to help relieve some of the burden in those categories. We have uh, all sorts of information. We've shared it uh, many times before. We provide some general information on westchestergov.com, our website page. But the real place that you want to go to look is at the state level. As I mentioned before, you can find a vaccination information at mieligible.covid19 vaccine. I read the whole thing. It's there for you to look at. Um, <clears throat> there's a hotline number, 1 877 4829. There's also a, 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 
uh, a click on to go to uh, the forms you need for the vaccine, and then another one that will be sort of general information, what you need to know. Using the modern tools of communication with websites and online information factors out a lot of individuals. So if you are computer savvy and you have a relative or neighbor that is not computer savvy, somebody who's much older, maybe somebody who's ill, reach out to them and give them a helping hand. A person who's a shut-in and in their advanced years is not going to be able to negotiate these things. Many of us in our prime years have trouble negotiating this kind of equipment and information. But reach out to somebody that needs it because this is how the state is structured. This is how it's happening, I think, in most states. You're using the online structure to get information. But not everybody is capable of doing that. Not everybody has computer access. So if you have a neighbor, a friend, a relative, reach out to them. If you have skills that can help them, this is something you can do. Uh, particularly if you're under that age, you haven't gotten your vaccine yet, help somebody else get a vaccine that needs it, and you'll be doing a good deed, and you help us get through all of this. I'm going to ask Ken to um, uh, explain uh, the most recent uh, uh, information that we received from Governor Cuomo, and then I'll come back to talk about a few things, and I have some uh, people I want to introduce you to in a few minutes. Ken. Thanks, George. And as um, the county executive continues to, um, to reinforce throughout um, the messaging and throughout all of the pandemic, the state um, issues the guidelines to our local government, to our local health department. He sets, the governor uh, sets the, the guidelines and the parameters throughout the state, and then we execute them. But those parameters usually start at the, the national level and the CDC. And since the beginning of the pandemic last year in March, there have been many, many, many changes. The county executive outlined some of them earlier. Today, Governor Cuomo acted upon the CDC's recommendation from yesterday. Dr. Walensky from the, um, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, made some modifications that said that if you have completed your vaccinations, so right now that means both shots, then you're able to not have to quarantine under a specific set of circumstances. One is that you have both of your stocks or you have completed your vaccination. So when the Johnson & Johnson or any other ones come down the road um, that are just one shot, you've completed that vaccination. You then have a two week period after that last vaccination that has to occur. So that gives you maximum um, protection from the vaccine as it uh, does its work. Um, and then you'll be able to move forward. The third thing, the second thing, is now you have to have be asymptomatic. So you cannot have any symptoms, and then you're able to not have to quarantine. And the shot has to be administered within the last three months. So once again, um, two weeks after your final completion of vaccine dosage, then three months, no more than three months afterwards, and asymptomatic, and then you do not have to quarantine. And that is extremely important, as the county executive mentioned, the vaccines have moved, um, the vaccine eligible people have moved up. You know, so whether those are teachers and bus drivers or um, restaurant workers, taxi cab drivers, et cetera, that means those folks do not have to quarantine as long as all three of those scenarios are met. Once again, last um, vaccination, two weeks after that vaccination, no symptoms, asymptomatic, no symptoms. And that shot has been administered within the last three months. And the CDC then recommends, and the governor has approved and has stated for the state of New York, that is 90 days, three months after that vaccination, you do not have to quarantine and move forward. Now, again, to, to highlight and to say the same things that the county executive continues to say, this does not mean to let your guard down. While there's 37,000 people that have gotten vaccinations and many vaccinations have happened throughout the county, it is no time to let your guard down. Um, the CDC and the state continue to make sure to recommend to everyone to follow the same procedures um, to make sure that you, you mask up and in some cases double mask up. Make sure you continue to keep your, your distance, physical distance, and wash your hands and make sure that we keep doing all those things together. This is uh, exciting news because, again, that means the vaccination and that process is doing well and moving forward. But for Westchester County, if we've got 37,000 or so folks that have been vaccinated out of the county center out of our million people, there's a lot of work left to be done. And let's not lose focus now. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ken. <clears throat> I want to highlight 
uh, a program that's been established by Westchester County through our uh, Office of Tourism and Film. It's called Dine Out Westchester, Dine On Westchester. I want to thank Natasha Caputo, who heads that office, for taking on this uh, assignment. We know that uh, we've had a, a major change in our lifestyle uh, since COVID came in. Uh, the, the restaurants and all other businesses were fairly much shut down during the months of April and, and into uh, May as they started to reopen. And we had summertime dining outdoors and then extended that into the fall, even into the very fringes of the winter with outdoor heaters and so forth. Uh, those businesses of Westchester, we tried to you know help them, incentivize them to stay afloat. And uh, their folks trying to get money, uh, that revenue necessary for them to stay uh, alive. A number of restaurants and other businesses have failed during this. The economic pressures have been more than they could bear, even with our grant program and some of the other programs. So in this way, uh, there's an effort being made to try to identify restaurants, highlight them, uh, a place that you can go to look at and pick out some of the fine restaurants, the, the great uh, meals that are all over the county. We've got a lot of award-winning restaurants from one end of the county to the other. It's a great opportunity for you if you live in any part of the county to go beyond the area that you know well and the local places that you're most comfortable with and have a special night out to one of the other locations. Uh, this listing page is on visitwestchesterny.com. It'll highlight these restaurants. It'll tell you, you know, how they're serving their customers, and uh, they'll, they'll give you the information you need to know about hours of operation, whether there's outdoor dining and, and other types of things. We think it's a good way to be helpful in the process to our restaurateurs who are trying to work very hard to survive during this very different, uh, difficult economic time. So I'd also now like to uh, talk about uh, a new person who's joining our team, and, and in it I'm going to invite up uh, Ken and I'll step out while uh, three of our executives are up. Kathy O'Connor is our Commissioner of Parks, Recreation, and Conservation. I'll ask her to come to the mic first. She'll be joined by First Deputy Commissioner uh, Peter Tartaglia and our newest Deputy Commissioner Andre Early. And uh, we're very happy that Andre joined us. We stole him from the town of Greenberg. My apologies to Paul Feiner and my friends there. Andre is an outstanding recreational professional. We're happy to bring him on in this capacity. We've been taking the time over the last uh, few weeks to introduce you to new people that have joined our administration, not just in our executive offices like Lisa Reyes, those who've been promoted like uh, Martha Lopez, Marco Lopez and others. Uh, and then also uh, we went over to the Correctional Institution where we showed you the new executive team that's operating there. So we want to show you this in parks. Uh, Kathy and Peter and I have been in contact in the beginning of this pandemic during the spring and the summer, like every hour on the hour. Yeah. And we talked about what was happening at Playland and Kensico Dam. Now that we have uh, sort of moved to the winter programs where things stop, even golf has stopped for a couple of months while we rest the greens and the fairways. Uh, we're not talking all the time, but we're very happy that uh, Kathy will uh, give you a quick introduction, and then we're going to hear from Andre Early himself, who is our newest Deputy Commissioner. So first, Commissioner uh, O'Connor. Thank you very much, County Executive Latimer. As you've heard over the last year, the County Parks Department never closed. In fact, we were probably busier than we've ever been busier, uh, ever before. Um, we truly have become naturally essential, which is now our new tagline. Um, that being said, we are absolutely thrilled that the County Executive and his administration saw to the necessity of adding a deputy commissioner to our department. I've been, asked for, I've been asking for it for many, many years. I finally stopped asking and I got it. So that's probably the key to, to my success right now. Be quiet. Um, but we are over the moon on having another deputy commissioner. Um, Mr. Early, coming from Greenberg, uh, he will be uh, working closely with our division of the Parks Department and the Recreation Division. He also will be overseeing the County Center, but obviously right now that's a little bit out of his hands. So um, with that being said, Andre comes from Greenberg, as the county executive mentioned. He has been the commissioner of community services there. The fact that he lives right off the Bronx River Parkway is fabulous. He lives right between Kensico Dam and the county center. It's not two hours away like some of our other staff, so we're thrilled that he's nearby, he's hands-on, he's a hard worker, and he started just this past Monday, and we've introduced him to as many people as we could, but uh, once the weather changes a little bit, we'll certainly get him out and about, but um, thank you again to the county executive for seeing 
the uh, need, the necessity to add another deputy. We have a wonderful first deputy in Peter. Um, now we have another deputy who will be handling, as I said, Parks Division, Recreation, and County Center. So thank you very much, and good luck to Andre. Andre Early. Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon. I trust all is well. Uh, I would like to first uh, just thank uh, County Executive Latimer, uh, Deputy County Executive uh, Jenkins, for allowing me this opportunity just to uh, be before you and join the naturally uh, essential team uh, with the county uh, parks and recreation and conservation uh, team. Um, I would like to say this. This is part of the master plan. Um, I'm a little bit closer to actually having a day designated for bow ties. So <laughs> I cannot wait for that. Um, but it is truly an honor, a privilege, and a blessing uh, to be able to uh, uh, leave a place that I truly, genuinely love, but I ensure the uh, town board that I did leave the department and, and the Theodore D. Young Community Center facility in great hands. So with that being said, it's been a, uh, a great journey thus far. I know two important angels are looking down upon me, uh, making sure that they continue to see a return on their investment <laughs> as they were uh, former and retirees of the county as well. So everything came back full circle. So this is a, an amazing opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of the team. Thank you, Andre. And uh, I just want to highlight that uh, Andre represents an individual who has great academic credentials. He's an undergraduate at Hampton University, has his Master of Business Administration from Mercy College. Uh, and he has also served in the county uh, in some of our volunteer boards and commissions, most notably on the Human Rights Commission and as a subsidiary of that, our Fair Housing Board uh, he's been involved in the White Plains Juneteenth Heritage Celebration Committee, uh, active in the NAACP, and uh, he's got the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. If I don't mention that, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's the Nourish Show White Plains chapter. So we're very happy to have Andre with us. And I think uh, what we're showing when we introduce different people is the desire of Westchester County to find talented people wherever we can find them as well as, as we did initially when we came into office, maintaining an office, those uh, leaders of different departments that we knew were talented and could run their departments well, and doing the very best we can to let merit be the basis for the, uh, for the hires and the appointments and the maintenance of employment that we have. So I want to thank again our three executives who are here, to, uh, to Kathy, to Peter, and now to Andre. Thank you for being with us. And uh, you're free to go back to the parks. And <laughs> Thank you very much. Do whatever comes next. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the press, uh, and then I'll just have a couple of wrap-up comments. Uh, Catherine Chaffee, Director of Communications, uh, what questions do we have that await us? So the first question comes from Sophie from the Journal News. She asks, is the county involved in or planning any initiative to connect educators with vaccines and get teachers vaccinated more quickly? Yes, Sophie, we've actually, Sophie from the Journal News, I don't have the last name, but uh, we've uh, actually been very active in trying to reach out uh, through the various school districts and through the various uh, NYSET uh, local uh, union chapters to get as many teachers vaccinated as we can. Uh, we're working as we speak right now and having them come through as groups. Uh, they are one of the categories of occupations that the governor has prioritized. They go back a number of weeks in terms of eligibility. And getting teachers vaccinated is an essential part of getting schools open. As a matter of personal public policy, I'd like to see all of our schools open. I'd, I'd like to see the children back in the school. I think that's the best possible learning environment when they're in a classroom setting with the professional teaching and the executive administration over them, we get the best possible results. We know that part of the reason that uh, would make it safe is to make sure we vaccinate uh, or have vaccinated as many of the teachers as is possible, certainly those who feel they're in vulnerable circumstances, and, uh, and to make sure those that are in classroom contact have that. So yes, we have, um, you know, we don't release numbers per district, but we've worked with the White Plains District. I think right now we're involved with the Irvington District and Pelham and a number of other places, and we're working all across the county in the various 44 districts that include the two BOCES uh, districts as well. Okay, the next question is also from Sophie. She asks, is the county in communication with the state DOH about potential updates to the six-foot social distancing guidance for schools? Uh, we've had direct contact uh, with the state DOH to, to clarify 
what their position is. The, the, the basic way these things work, the state Department of Health establishes uh, health department standards, and it's the county Department of Health that has to administer them. In certain cases, they give us some discretion, but the discretion is within very limited parameters. It depends on how the state has defined what is acceptable or not acceptable. And they have said that the, the, the foot distance is acceptable. The lower uh, amount of distance, if there are barriers, the, the, the larger distance uh, acceptable without barriers. The problem with barriers, think in terms of plexiglass shields, is a concern that many of our fire departments have raised about how we would get children out of a classroom if we have those barriers in the way, and, and how does that happen? So you're caught in a maze of competing uh, needs. You want to keep kids safe from the disease. You want to keep kids safe from any, you know, uh, break out of fire. These things don't happen frequently, but if they do and a tragedy uh, occurs out of this, then we, then we have a much worse situation than we have now. So we have tried to get some clarification from the state to make sure who has what discretion, how much of it is the health department's discretion, and how much it, of it is the discretion of the school superintendents and the school boards. Every school district has unique physical realities to their buildings. There are some districts that can, that can comply with the state rules because of the way their physical uh, space is laid out. They happen to have particularly large classrooms, and they can space out, and so they're back in full. Some are not. And of course, the vaccination of teachers becomes an important part of the mix. But in essence, Sophie, we're trying to clarify to make sure that the state uh, gives us the exact understanding of what our responsibility and what our discretion is. Okay. The next question comes from David Proper from the Journal News. With the county passing 2,000 COVID deaths today, can you reflect on that number? And what message do you have for the families and friends that lost a loved one? Well, I, I think the only relevant comment is when you personalize what it is. In my life, I've lost my mother and I've lost my father. I remember the circumstances of my father's death, which took place over a period of time where he deteriorated in health before we lost him. And my mother's death was, was a surprise to me, it, to all of us. It was an aneurysm. And uh, we just found out that she had died when, when uh, my sister went to uh, be with her. I remember seeing my father uh, at the Westchester Medical Center on the last night of his life. He'd been hospitalized for a number of weeks. And when I give you these hospitalization numbers and I talk about people being hospitalized for weeks, I remember when my father was hospitalized for three weeks and we knew it was not going well during that period of time. The loss of my father in my life was significant as it was for my mother, as it is for everybody. Uh, this past week, uh, we've just had other tragedies. I don't want to announce them in this context, but we have one of our top county officials in the education area just lost her spouse and others. And, and, and it's incalculable when you lose a spouse, certainly when you lose a child, when you lose a sibling, when you lose a parent. So I don't look at the number 2,000 and, and think to myself, well, that number is lower than 3,000. Uh, or somehow that percentage is better than some other county's percentages. I think of how I felt mm -hmm. the last night that I was in the Westchester Medical Center and I saw my father lying on that bed. He was in his, he was in his 80s. You know, he had lived a good long life. Um, but I, I knew we were losing him, and it felt, you know, incredibly hurtful. There were no words. And I'm a person of words. Uh, I live on words. I read, I write, and I, I, I share them, I speak them. And so 2002, other groups of families, more than one person per death, has gone through that same experience. And they, they know that however ill their loved one might have been, that COVID contributed to their death. That had that COVID not been on the scene, that loved one would still be alive. And in some cases, the, the stories are tragic. People under the age of 40 dying from this with a whole life ahead of them. I often think of myself at my age, what would happen if I died at an earlier age? <clears throat> when you hear about somebody dying in their 40s and I'm in my 60s, I say, what if my life ended at that? Would have never seen my daughter married. Would have never had this, never seen a grandchild. Those things had I died at that period of time. So you personalize it. That's the only way you can understand these numbers is to make it real to you as a human being. We all have the same basic realities as humans. We laugh, we cry, we live, we get old, we die. But it's still a loss. And so I think when we have our memorial uh, commemoration in a couple of weeks on the one year anniversary, we're not celebrating anything. We're not celebrating when we have, uh, somebody misunderstood that in one of these things. We're not celebrating when we vaccinate 
35,000 people. We're doing what we have to do to try to prevent that next family from going through that experience. And that's what I think of. And I think it's my responsibility, my team's responsibility. But at the end of the day, I take the responsibility personally. I asked to be county executive. I've had this opportunity for almost four years. And it's my responsibility to try to make the most intelligent decisions I can to protect those lives at the same time, understanding that life goes on. And so we figure out, as we did with the Recreation Department last summer, what can we do safely? And how do we do it safely? And we task our professionals to come up with a way to handle things safely. And they figured out how we could have our beaches open and our pools open, miraculously, and still not spread the disease. And we didn't spread the disease. We didn't spread the disease through Bicycle Sunday. And we didn't spread it on our golf courses. And we didn't spread it on our walking paths. So it's that constant balancing. And you fail every time I look at these numbers, because I see these numbers every day. I keep these sheets. In fact, it's a source of great humor amongst the rest of my executive team. I've got this old school, you know, this is how I learned business in the 70s and 80s, and I still track it numerically. It's my handwriting on every page. I know these numbers, and I know, and I understand that there are people behind those numbers. And that's how you understand this. There's human beings behind every one of these numbers. Do everything you can to make sure that number doesn't go up one more integer if you can help it. Next question comes from Samantha Crawford from News 12. She asks, The CDC says the possibility of transmission of COVID from vaccinated persons to others is still uncertain, but that that the societal benefits of avoiding unnecessary quarantine may outweigh the potential risk of transmission. Do you agree? Well, I'm, I'm not in a position to disagree with the CDC. My knowledge of science and medicine is you could put it a thimble. Uh, Samantha Crawford from News 12 asking this question. Thank you, Samantha. Um, I, I think we've watched advice adjust as time goes on from every professional source. And I'm sure in the world of those who are experienced in uh, communicable diseases, they discuss and debate amongst themselves in the same way that sports fans argue over who we thought would win the Super Bowl. And as much as I thought I knew football, I was wrong, like badly wrong. The, The CDC has given us direction. And then at various times, they've modified that direction. So I accept the modification from whatever the dialogue is happening at the highest level of medical profession, and they are adjusting based on what information they're getting, which I'm not privy to. So we try to follow the CDC guidelines when the state isn't more specific. When the state is more specific, the structure in this state and every state is that the state government has the superior authority. They set the rules. The rest of us try to follow it and implement it. But when the CDC changes their uh, their guidelines, we adjust to those changes of guidelines. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about having two masks on. If the if the ultimate uh, uh, feedback is wear two masks, I'll wear two masks. The mission, as I just said in the answer to the last question, is to get through this with the least amount of fatality, least amount of injury. So uh, I accept the CDC's uh, interpretation, and we move forward trying to implement it. And if they change it and they have a basis for the change, then we'll adjust to the change. And the last question is another question from David Proper. He asks, have the refrigerated morgues installed at the Grasslands campus this December been used during the second wave? Uh, David Proper from uh, uh, the Journal News. Uh, I don't believe they have been used. Uh, uh, at this point, we haven't reached the, uh, the increase in fatalities that would uh, generate it. When we had the overflow of our... Um, of our system previously, back in the spring. We had more fatalities we can handle. We were losing over 30 people a night, 30, 35, 40 people a night. And that's what overtaxed the systems that could handle uh, those uh, fatalities. So we have not reached that point yet. We've had a couple of nights with uh, double, low double digit fatalities, 11 or 12, many nights uh, lately with four or five. So we haven't reached the point that the system can't handle it. Uh, it is it is a bit ghoulish to have to have put these things in place, but they are there. And if we do find that uh, the fatality numbers start to jump up beyond what you can handle under normal civilian situations, then we'll be prepared to handle it. Hopefully, that day won't ever come. Any more questions, Catherine? Questions. Very good. Well, if anyone else from the press has any additional questions, feel free to direct them to us uh, here. Uh, Catherine Chaffee is our Director of Communications. We'll be happy to do it. Our fabulous Parks Department has a new 
public relations liaison. She was here with us, Emily Lavin. She's with the Parks Department now. And uh, the Parks Department has much of the positive news that there is to talk about in Westchester County, the upcoming events that we will be holding as we get closer to the spring. Uh, and so Kathy, Peter, and now Andre will be able to uh, fashion some interesting programs. And, uh, you know, we will have an opportunity to... Um, uh, to uh, smile again and laugh again uh, as we get through this. I'm George Latimer. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll report again uh, this coming, uh, well, I guess we won't do it on Monday. Monday a, is a holiday. We're doing it on Tuesday. Forgive me for doing this in live TV. Uh, you can see I'm not a professional at this. But uh, so it'll be Tuesday, February 16th, when we'll report to you again here, Monday being a President's Day, a federal holiday. Um, we wish you all a very happy weekend. And let me give an advisory to all of my fellow men out there, Valentine's Day is this weekend. You may forget it. She will not. Don't say I didn't tell you. Have a wonderful day.